Um, we're going to talk about networking and uh, how networking can be put to use with regards to fighting for animal rights, fighting, fighting for more just food uh, system. Mm, yeah, and uh, when I thought about giving a talk at CARE, I came up with three topics and I actually asked a couple of my colleagues what would be the most relevant one. And uh, among them, it turned out that uh, both Veronica and Pavel, who I asked, they mentioned that networking is a skill that uh, is kind of maybe underappreciated uh, within the animal, acti animal rights activists, and maybe it's a bit undervalued. And with this talk, I'm going to try to maybe encourage you more to see it as a something that can make your make our work make make our fight more effective more smooth at times um, and i hope it's it's a fun ride for this next 30 minutes and yeah i would like us to see uh, networking as something that can make things more smooth so we're always busy with doing a lot of things and there's so much things to do uh, and networking is like a, i would say that can a thing that can kind of oil the machine and make things happen better. Uh, in the next 30 minutes or so, we're going to talk about networking. <laughs> uh, and it's th this talk is mostly based on like personal experience, so there's not so much like data, insights, um, some s very deep anal uh, the analysis of science behind networking. But there is some, some bit to it uh, with regard to the power of social networks. Uh, I'm going to share also a bit about uh, the power of, uh, uh, the, the, of not so, the power of not so usual approach to networking. And I will also try to uh, bring up why actually it's, it makes sense to uh, become a good networker. Uh, while being animal rights activists. Um, and then I, I will try to share some tips. I don't know if you can say tips, but uh, tips and some ideas for uh, overcoming some natural barriers that we uh, have when networking. And I mean it especially in, when it comes to using your social skills in fields or in areas where we're not surrounded by people who share common values, like here. I think here it's a great exercise, like to today, yesterday, and in the remaining couple of days at CARE, everyone has been like really well doing their networking, but we're also in a group of people who are sharing similar values, sharing uh, common goals, so it's kind of a very nice environment to, to do networking, whereas uh, it's not always the case. So. Uh, I'm also going to try to talk a bit uh, about that. Mm. And if we have time, uh, I'm also going to share a couple of fruits of networking from our story, uh, of the story of working with Rostinia Yame, the plant-based outreach campaign in Poland. Uh, again, it's, it's mostly like anecdotal, uh, but uh, it can give you a hint like where it can lead you. And uh, lastly, uh, I also thought that it might make sense to uh, bring a bit about networking in pandemics and the lessons that we can take from that time that is kind of almost finished, but you never know. Uh, but there's also plenty of uh, stuff that uh, we could have learned during pandemics that are very much applicable in our daily work. So. Uh, just a short word on the, my, my background. Uh, I might be the person who finds it quite easy to build relations with people, but it was not always the case. Uh, uh, I remember the time when I was like feeling very awkward talking with people, reaching out to strangers. And uh, when I was thinking about this talk, uh, I actually realized that uh, Building those social skills and building the networking skills is something that you can really learn. It's not something that comes natural. And in my case, uh, uh, the story that kind of 
made me a good person uh, or made me quite skilled networker, if you can say that, was uh, punk rock and punk rock community. Uh, I, play, I played and I play in a punk rock band and uh, I was always the person who was forced to talk with uh, people who were to book our shows. Uh, I was the one who had to reach out uh, to friends of friends of friends uh, of people who might help us to arrange tours and so on. And uh, funny is, as it is, but it really took us to places. Because of that, we traveled to uh, Brazil and some places that we couldn't dream of being a very small band that, I don't know, probably no one cares about. So uh, it was a great way to actually uh, practice the, the, uh, the, skill, the social skills, practice uh, um, the, uh, the abilities to reach out to strangers. And also, it's, again, like an anecdotal example of the power of social network, which I'm going to move now to. And yeah, as I said, it's not so much uh, data-oriented presentation, but there is some science behind so social networks uh, and the interconnectedness of people in general. And uh, two things that are two, two interesting uh, studies have, have been made over the recent years. One of them uh, is by Nicholas Christiakis, who has a very interesting TED talk um, that you can check. And he actually studied something that he called the obesity clusters. So uh, he learned that, um, he found out that there's a direct, influ uh, di direct influence uh, of uh, your network, of your closest relationships, between, uh, and your chance to become more obese. And the, the, uh, the fun thing is that, or the interesting thing is that it's not only your like, very close circle, like uh, your close family or close friends, but actually uh, even to the third degree of relationship. So a friend of a friend of a friend uh, can sig uh, statistic stati statistically significantly affect your chances to become obese. There are like 10% chance that if a person that you probably don't know is obese, that you will be also obese. It's not like uh, something uh, very significant, but it's, it's, it's really interesting. And the other thing that uh, is more recent, there was a study in Nature, um, and that study um, showed up that uh, kids, who, the poor kids who are kind of mingling with the kids who are more wealthy, uh, um, actually are more likely to earn 20% more than the kids who just stay within the circle of the kids who are less privileged. And it's like, this, these are like very, uh, I would say, straightforward examples, uh, but it shows that uh, people uh, actually um, ob obtain uh, various values, various uh, be behavioral uh, norms and ideas from each other. So that's something that uh, actually we don't consider that often when it comes to networking and, um, and building relations, which I will get to in a second. And one more thing on social networks. Uh, it's not always the best idea to have a big network. I would rather say that it's uh, more relevant that you have a strong network. So for, for, for a lot of us, it's it's, it seems like networking is something very difficult because you have to reach out to strangers and the people who are important. What I think is uh, important is that uh, you can use the networks or the relationships that already, you already have to actually find out ways to people who you want to reach. So uh, building that strong network rather than big is, uh, I think, uh, slightly more important. And yeah, uh, networking can seem like something very stressful, uh, maybe also like flat because it's like oriented on uh, having some, uh, creating some business or, I know, some opportunities for us. I would say that uh, it's not always the case and uh, I would even put the risk to uh, 
put an equation mark between networking and relationship building because this is what uh, I strongly believe that it's not only a uh, very transactional kind of uh, thing, it's rather making relationships and I could really uh, relate to what uh, Aaron Ross was saying yesterday on his talk on uh, the, the art of negotiation because it's pretty much uh, similar and it's uh, based on the same principles. Um, yeah, and also, uh, of course, there is a fine line between networking and socializing, uh, whereas like socializing is, I, I would say that networking is a intentful form of socializing. So there is always some benefit that you can gain, but it's not uh, the core thing. And I think like the, uh, the, the mistake that a lot of people make when thinking about networking is that uh, they kind of have to obtain something from a person, whereas this is something that comes later or that can maybe come, maybe not. So uh, sometimes uh, when I'm at the conference and like some, either I am reaching out to someone or someone is reaching out to me, it feels very weird when you're approached by a person who wants something from you immediately. It's, it doesn't feel right and it's, it's the next step that may happen, but may not as well. So this is something that I would like to maybe uh, pinpoint a bit. Uh, and yeah, um, now a uh, couple of things that uh, might not be so obvious and some are obvious when it comes to putting networking to work for our cause. So one of the basic things where networking can be useful for animal rights activists or plant-based outreach activists is uh, getting access to other people's networks and knowledge base. And uh, we have a lot of cases at Roślinie Jame where uh, because of networking, we actually could use the network and the expertise of people who we wouldn't even imagine reaching out to. Uh, one example could be the fact that um, some time ago, uh, I don't even remember when, but we've met a lawyer who is who turned out to be vegetarian. So we immediately shared like a, a, some, some com basic common values, and it turned out that this person was uh, is running a food law specializing company. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, we could actually, we immediately gained access to the skills that this person has. And it was maybe a year later when we reached out to uh, this guy, Daniel, and asked him, hey, like, we, that we were facing this issue that uh, there's big discussion about plant-based products labeling and some people are confused, they don't know if they call, can call the plant-based sausage the sausage and so on. So maybe could, you could help us out uh, uh, and prepare some sort of expertise that uh, all the companies uh, that, uh, that are in our network can, uh, can make use. And of course they were eager to do so and then we followed up with many other like similar expert, expert publications and because of the fact that we kind of build that relationship we paid zero zlotys for that, so uh, so this is something that uh, is a, like a very simple example, but uh, shows that uh, uh, that kind of relationship building can pay off later in the future. Uh, one more other thing that uh, I mentioned in the beginning is uh, the way that the, the thing that net networking can actually make things happen sm more smooth, smoother. I don't know. <laughs> More smooth, probably. Uh, smoother, whatever. Both works. Uh, um, so if, if you, and I think it is especially applicable to campaigns like cage-free work, welfare, or like broiler work, or plant-based outreach work, whereas uh, we often have very high goals. We want to reach high-end people, and we don't know how to actually get to them. Uh, we can, of course, find an email to the office and try to get, get that way, but probably 
some of you know that it's not the most effective way actually of making connections. Whereas uh, uh, it's quite likely that as you are already like, so some of you are already like working in that field, for example, of food industry, you might find a way that to reach out to this person through someone who you know or who knows this person uh, better. And uh, it, I would say that it really increases the chances of actually making things happen. And one example that is uh, also not so usual, because it's uh, an example from cage free com campaign helping plant based campaign to get connected, is uh, the way that uh, is, 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 is a uh, case study where we um, at Rostiniemy we really wanted to start working on uh, plant based egg alternatives and mainstreaming plant-based uh, plant egg alternatives among egg producers because this is like this is the uh, area of industry that we really wanted to uh, tackle and we have zero connections with uh, major food egg, egg, major egg producers in Poland and it turned out that cage free uh, campaigners uh, from Otwarte Klatki had a very well established connection with them because they started working on uh, cage-free policies long time ago. And because of that connection and that introduction that they gave us, which I had like li very little hopes that it would work because why would a major egg company be interested in plant-based eggs that are like a very uh, tiny part of market or uh, literally they are not existent in Poland? Why would they like, engage in conversa conversation about those topics? And it turned out that they are interested. And uh, now we're talking about them investing in a uh, couple of plant-based egg companies. So this really kind of fosters the uh, chances of making things happen. And also, I think it can take you to places, like the, to, the, to places like uh, you, could, you wouldn't imagine. It's the same like my punk, punk band going to Brazil. Like, I wouldn't imagine that uh, at that time, and probably I wouldn't imagine myself uh, working with the biggest egg producer in Poland as well. Uh, so that's really cool. And uh, one more cool thing is getting gossip. Uh, uh, that also, or gossip, or I would say like maybe relevant information that you wouldn't get in a, a non-networking, not relationship, uh, building situation uh, and that's something that uh, just happens organically and people just like to talk and sometimes you get to learn things that they wouldn't say in an official situation uh, but I uh, purposely left that one last thing called, that uh, is on the slide normalizing our approach to uh, and values through networking and this is I think one of the core um, benefits that networking can have and that we don't actually uh, uh, we, we, we don't really see that uh, on a daily basis so again like as I, as I, as I talked about this the power of social network uh, and yesterday Aaron talked about uh, people like animal rights activists or vegan activists are being seen as freaks uh, so in order to kind of normalize our approach, we need to be in that network and we need to be the ones who kind of spread the, the fact that uh, those values are more normal, are actually acceptable. And there's, I think there is no better way than actually like engaging with people and building relationships with people who we want to affect. If let's say in the food industry, we are seen as crazy vegans. Uh, it's not, it's not going to take us anywhere. It's like all, it would be always us versus them. If we actually engage and talk and uh, present ourselves as people, basically, uh, that, uh, that you can have like a valuable conversation, it uh, kind of normalizes. And uh, we've really witnessed that in Poland as uh, I think like I started working at Rostiniem uh, four years ago or four and a half years ago. And at that time, uh, we started going to different like food industry fairs and trying to 
talk about this uh, whole thing about introducing plant-based products. And at the time, we have been seen as uh, weirdos who are crazy activists and were mostly ignored. But as we kept kind of being present and uh, engaging in different relationships, uh, I, I could really see that uh, a lot of companies actually changed their narrative. And a lot of individuals in the companies that we wanted to approach actually, uh, I would say, like started talking our language. Uh, so that was, that, was, that was a very interesting thing to see. And uh, I think it. That I think that networking and that relationship building is really a great tool to actually normalize our approach and present ourselves as uh, relevant discussion partners or, let's say, like business partners. So, uh, yeah, um, I know that <laughs> networking can be hard, and uh, we are we are all humans. Uh, even Kuba, Kuba is our super superhuman at the Uh And uh, one more thing that uh, I wanted to mention that is that for a lot of us, it's not a natural situation to talk to strangers. But at the same time, it is also not a natural situation to that person that we want to reach to, to talk to a stranger. So uh, I think it's important to understand that, uh, yeah, we are like kind of the same. We share simi similar fears, similar, similar emotions. Uh, so that, that's a good baseline when we think about uh, networking and building relationship, re relationships through networking. Uh, and I could really, really uh, relate to what Aaron said about uh, the art of negotiation, because it's also like basically relationship building. Uh, I really like what he said about being kind of respectful. I would extend that to being kind, because that, that's like a very simple thing, simple tool that can also take you places when building relationships. So if you're open, if you're up to giving when talking with, I know, like poten stranger, strangers that could be potential uh, partners for, I know, your welfare policy or could be maybe your even potential, potential target. Maybe you, through being kind, you can make, think, make things happen harder, uh, easier. Uh, it's not always the case with some welfare work when uh, some companies are more reluctant. But uh, I think it could be a good starting point. Uh, and then you see what happens. Uh, and as Aaron said again, like listening uh, and active listening is a, a really cool tool and it's also like a human tool that uh, kind of facilitates networking, in my opinion. Uh, and yeah, uh, a lot of people would have this approach, especially when it comes to uh, bigger events, when they are uh, not surrounded by people who share similar values or similar beliefs. They would say, like, networking sucks. It's not for me. I really, I'm really bad at networking. And well, that's normal, and everyone gets this feeling, especially if you are put in a very uncomfortable position of being alone in a room of other strangers. Uh, so there are a couple of ideas that I had based on my experience that can help you to kind of maybe not overcome, but to accommodate those acquiredness. Acquiredness? feeling awkward uh, um, when, you, when you're about to network. And one, uh, one more thing would be definitely starting smaller. So if you, if you uh, are at a given event or in a given social situation when you are exposed to many strangers, maybe it's not the best, like it's not an easy uh, concept to talk to 10 people, but maybe you can think about talking to that one person and building actual relationship with this person. And that could be already a win. Uh, another thing that uh, I see as something that is highly valuable is actually doing your homework, which I mean uh, by researching who is present at the event and maybe shooting them an email or connecting with them in any other way. Uh, 
because that already makes the connection uh, easier, I would say, like in a, in a simple words. Uh, so I really encourage like researching who is actually going to uh, be present in a social situation because it's not all on, only conferences and stuff, but it can be other other also other forms of uh, spaces where you can actually uh, use networking. And LinkedIn is a great tool. I will get to that in a second. Um, one more thing that uh, I found particularly useful when I'm in a big room of strangers is that sometimes there are those kind of themed tables, themed groups that you can actually use, like social tables or people that talk about a given, uh, given area. So that's something that uh, happens often at the conferences. And in that way, you're exposed to a smaller uh, circle of people who already have a common topic to discuss. So it's, if, if you are into that given topic, it's kind of easier to uh, make it work. And uh, yeah, I also uh, encourage everyone to be kind of self-forgiving. So if, if you feel awkward with networking, you don't have to be like, you know, the best networker ever. Maybe like, as I said, like start small and that can take us to places. Uh, I don't know if I should bore you with the successes, uh, but uh, we had some fruits of networking. Uh, and while, while, while it's, some, it's hard to say that it's like direct result of networking, but because of building relationships with certain people, we managed to introduce plant-based line in the biggest convenience chain in Poland. Or uh, more recently, uh, I'm now working on the conference program for our plant-based corporate outreach work event. And I had this idea that we should maybe have uh, some people who represent finance sector uh, in the, uh, the conference to talk how actually like banks and that kind of institutions uh, react to, to the changes that we want to push in, in the food system. And I know, I know literally one person that worked in a bank in, uh, and I, re I decided to reach out to, the, to, to her. And I met her like, I don't know, at some conference some time ago. So it wasn't like a strong connection. It turned out that she's not working in this bank anymore. And she changed her job to become a head of some very important department in that bank. And I sent her like a semi-official message on LinkedIn saying, oh, dear, blah, blah, blah. We would like to invite to the conference, blah, blah, blah. And she said like, hey, Maciek, what's up? How are you doing? And uh, now we, it was like, it was only because we had a nice conversation some time ago, and they are now becoming uh, speakers. They are now to become the speakers at the conference, which we would have never imagined a couple years back to have like a ma major bank from Poland talking about food system transformation and becoming turning food system to become more plant based. Uh, yeah, and I mentioned LinkedIn a couple of times, and uh, I kind of see direct link between pandemics and the use of LinkedIn. Uh, I would say that uh, the pandemic years made it kind of easier to network on many ways because we could sit at home and kind of reach out to people on the internet, and that thing actually, I think like uh, during that two years where we couldn't actually meet live were very good in terms of building network for Roślin Yeyeme. Because we felt kind of safe, we could uh, reach to people online and actually build those relationships uh, in a very uh, comfortable uh, format. So I encourage everyone to be present on LinkedIn. Uh, I see, I know that some people in this room are actually like very active. Uh, Connor, you're, you're quite active on LinkedIn, right? I would say, yeah. And uh, it's, it, it's pretty interesting because like, uh, maybe for people who do plant-based work, it's quite easy because it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's like more people who are, um, more, more, more food industry representatives who are kind of, the, 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 those people who happen to like you. And uh, I, I, I've seen like uh, 
Connor posting about a lot of welfare work that he's doing uh, and still getting some reactions and some, some interactions. So uh, it's not limited to uh, only plant-based food industry work. And I think uh, it helps him also to build a nice position as a, like an opinion leader. So that, that's something cool. And uh, I highly encourage everyone to kind of uh, undertake uh, LinkedIn as a kind of nice introduction to networking from your home or from your office, so in a, in a, in a kind of safe space uh, uh, to do so. And uh, yeah, uh, I don't know if we're going to do the activity, uh, but I think uh, the major takeaway would be to see networking as a way to normalize our approach and to make ourselves be seen as um, relevant partners to uh, people who we want to target. And the other thing is that uh, uh, that could be seen, that networking can be seen as an oil to kind of make the machine that of our goal work smoother. And uh, yeah, um, I'm up for uh, the talks. Uh, that QR code doesn't work, so <laughs> don't bother. <laughs> uh, but you, you yeah. I, I, I was uh, a bit too fast, and yeah, it doesn't work. But you can reach out to me on LinkedIn, or we all do uh, it on yeah, the old, the good old email is working. Uh, if you have any questions, let's do it. Uh, thank you for coming here, and thanks for all the good networking that happened so far at the conference. So I thought that like it doesn't make sense to push networking in that kind of weird. Uh, lecture situation. Yeah, thank you. And it's really hot here. Thanks, thanks a lot for, for the lecture. And uh, here are the questions. Uh, how do you cold approach people? Um, and could you maybe um, talk a bit more about cold approaching for those who aren't familiar with the term? Mm -hmm. uh, do you explain your intention early, or do you work on the relationship first? Well. Um, I, I would normally uh, try to use like cold but semi-cold approach. I, 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 I would say it uh, like that. And uh, normally, uh, I would use LinkedIn to approach people who I want to approach over email because it's it's kind of a bit more human in a way because at, at least you can see the face of someone who is reaching out to you and. Mm, in that matter, I would normally uh, uh, briefly add a note to why I am approaching this given person, but it would be a more general note. Because uh, I didn't, for, for those who are familiar with LinkedIn, uh, if you're sending a connection request, you can always add a note. And it's a very useful tool, because then you're kind of treated as a person who is not sending a random request to thousands, thousands of people, but there is some link to people, uh, to, to the person that you want to connect with. So uh, that's my favorite way of kind of semi-cold approaching people. Uh, if I have to use email, I would also briefly mention uh, in the, uh, what I'm about, but also try to kind of uh, present uh, our like the, the stuff that we do in a way that uh, can make the person who I'm approaching benefit from that in a one way or another. Mm. Yeah, I don't know if it, if it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, it does. I think you you have to balance between uh, like focusing on the business that you have towards the person and also like being genuinely yeah. interested in the relationship as well. As you've said, it's about relationships yeah. and not, uh, not just the business. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah, one more thing uh, that could be relevant is also, uh, especially for LinkedIn, uh, it's, it's a great tool because it's not only about sending requests, but also being present in someone else's network by uh, commenting on their posts and so on. So you could really kind of make yourself visible in that person's sphere. Uh, so you could have kind of a hook to, 
to make that uh, connection not so cold in the in the very uh, early stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, another question: Do you think that this type of networking that you're presenting should outgrow sooner or later the food and animal farming industry and reach to political levels? So, do you think this would this should scale? Totally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I have a, a small anecdote from Friday. Uh, just after I came from Warsaw, uh, I met with a, a friend of mine who is running a food tech accelerator, and we were just sitting and talking. It was, it was a non-formal meeting, and at one point, a friend of this person approached, and it turned out that he got interested in what we do, and he soon said that his father is a MP of Polish Parliament. So. Uh, you see, like a in very random situation can kind of lead you to getting connections to politicians, and uh, I would totally say that uh, you should make use of that not only in the business framework but also into in, in the instit institutional and uh, political framework as well. And it's a great way to kind of make things happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So this question was partially answered already, but where do you find people from companies to talk to, other than LinkedIn, I assume? Uh, what I like to do is uh, seeing conference lineups. <laughs> uh, not only the conferences that we are attending, but uh, just random food industry conferences. So we are usually targeting big companies. And usually, like representatives of big companies are invited to conferences to speak. So, uh, this is a good way to find relevant people to actually reach out to. Um, and yeah, other than that, just Google, <laughs> Google stuff, and uh, um, Google plus LinkedIn are great. <laughs> that, that's that's how mm -hmm. I do things. Okay. Most of the time, or try to find connections through. Uh, through some people who I already know. Yeah, through the yeah. already established network. Yeah, makes, makes making sense connections well. with journalists as well is a good idea uh, because they are connected with other people or other f food industry experts who serve to given companies is also a good, good tool to get introduced to food professionals. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Uh, what are your advice on how to feed, get deeper and deeper uh, in the relationship, and how time-consuming uh, is this, in your opinion? Well, uh, I, 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 I totally uh, believe that you should invest time in relationship building, and it is time-consuming. Uh, one thing that I liked yesterday about Aaron's talk, and I took it as a note to self, is being... Uh, um, being in, uh, having this integrity when building the relationship. So if you promise something, do deliver that. Uh, and uh, for me, it uh, often gets down to sending the email on time or the follow up on time. So uh, that's something that people really value. Um, what, I, what I also uh, happen to do occasionally uh, when it comes to like working with food industry professionals, uh, if I, for example, if I see an interesting article or a publication that could be also interesting for that given person, I would just send it to them and say, hey, this might interest you. And uh, it's a small thing. You're giving something to this person that it costs you zero, uh, but kind of helps to strengthen this relation uh, on a professional level. So that's something that uh, I occasionally use. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I think it partially maybe replies to the question of building the relationship and investing time in it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And does it ever like seem a bit uh, fake maybe to you? Do you ever struggle with that feeling that maybe it's not always a genuine uh, like uh, connection? It's that does it ever get in your way? Hard to say, to mm -hmm. be honest. Sometimes, of course, um, I would say like if you're kind by heart, um, even if you're reaching out to someone who you don't know and it might seem fake, if, if, if you're genuine and, uh, mm -hmm. as I said, like kind by heart, it doesn't feel that fake. But uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's different than sending 100 
I don't know, LinkedIn invitation or emails uh, to 100 individuals. I'm trying to take this individual approach that has, is maybe slower, but has bigger returns in the future. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, sure. I wouldn't say that it's like fake. Yeah, 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 this this yeah. way probably probably you're right. Uh, yeah, but uh, what what I can say uh, there is an interesting tool uh, that kind of makes building relationship a bit easier in a given situation. It's called Mail Merge, and it's a tool that kind of allows you to send personalized emails to vast amounts of people. And uh, when I use that tool, I always like would put a paragraph that is kind of still personal. So even if the email is kind of uh, a template email, there is also always a paragraph that kind of refers to a given relation. So, so that's something that kind of makes the response rate way higher. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's always lovely to get an uh, a message on LinkedIn with your name like <laughs> messed up. Yeah, 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 the the wrong wrong name, that and then that happens, yeah. then another one follow up with <laughs> with the correct one, <laughs> as if nothing ever happened. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. And and are there any like people uh, you wouldn't really want to like uh, contact? You wouldn't want to build a relationship with, but you have to for the business needs uh, is it ever a struggle yeah well like um, it's it's it, it's sometimes weird to like to try to connect with people who uh, exploit animals like you could like it, 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 it's, it's weird if you really don't share common values and I always like think about it from the bigger perspective and um, I mean like we have to work with those people to actually make our goals happen. Um, I had this story when it, it's not directly related with networking, but we are working with a given uh, with a meat processing company, and they invited us for a consulting session to their headquarters. Uh, and the headquarters also happened to be a slaughterhouse. Uh, in the, the, I mean, they had like a meat processing facility in the back of their office. So I really felt like the smell of death and like the smell of suffering there. So it was awkward, but I kind of pushed myself through it. And I think it's still like nothing compared to, I don't know what investigation activists do. So it's still like um, bearable, I would say, if, if you have to build uh, uh, or establish relationships with people who are way different and don't share those values that uh, you share. And again, like uh, if, if, if we are to talk about uh, achieving our goals, I think normalizing our values among those people where we feel uncomfortable is something that is very important for, for our goals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, do you have time for a few more? Sure. So, sure. so let's go. Uh, you said networking was not immediately easy for you. What were some of uh, your struggles early on? Well, like um, for sure, it's that feeling of awkwardness, as, and um, it, it as, as especially applies when you're in a uh, situation when you don't have like a. You don't share much common ground with the people who are uh, at the given event. So, if you're, um, let's say, like an early stage activist or like young activist who put are is put into the business conference of people who are wearing ties, and you're just like first time there, it feels very awkward. And it happened to me a couple of times that it wasn't very natural to actually talk to people because I also didn't know how to kind of make these relations and also make myself look credible. So uh, this is something that gets hard and, and, and was hard in the beginning. Um, I also kind of, like, it, it, I was also kind of scared of being exposed to strangers for a long time. And uh, for me, like, uh, if, if I would recall that uh, the time, and I was like a teenager, t teenager or so, what changed my approach was like going to I don't know student exchanges where I was like 
put into the group of people who are my co complete strangers and I had to kind of establish some sort of relationship with them because I was about to study with them for some time and that kind of helped. It's similar with like punk rock. Uh, you're in a room of strangers and mm, you kind of have to talk with them and so on. So, so there was some fear and there was some un awkwardness. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, well, okay. So maybe that's some encouragement for all of us here that you start also yeah. from a smaller... Uh, totally, like start, start small and like mm -hmm. that, that helps for sure. Mm, okay, and uh, what are some priorities right now for the Roslin uh, campaign? Uh, mm. Any interesting uh, um, like uh, prospects, any obstacles that you uh, see on your way? Yeah, so uh, right now our biggest uh, challenge is to develop the institutional and political lack of our work. And uh, we have Alicia who joined us and I see like the biggest potential right now for Polish food industry to actually, uh, for change is through legislative and political work. So uh, my feeling is that in Poland, at least, we kind of reached the status of plant-based market of of it of, of its potential being seen as something obvious for food producers. So it's not the most important to kind of nudge them with this uh, plant-based talk anymore, or it doesn't have to be. We don't have to put that much focus on it. So we really think like, what can we do to actually. Uh, introduce even more systemic and broader change on the national level. So that's something that we are excited about and also trying mm -hmm. to build. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. there's a lot of work, for, of work for, yeah. for you yeah. specifically also in this networking area. Um, yeah, and also new fields for networking. So I'm not so used to networking in the like political field, but we have some links, so we're going to put them to use. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, now a very practical question about this tool for personalizing emails that yeah. you mentioned. Uh, what's the name of it? It's called Mail Merge. Okay, and Mail Merge. Uh, highly recommended. Mm -hmm. Very useful because it also makes the emails look like, like you really sent them by yourself. So <laughs> <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, or yeah. you can just try sending your emails by yourself. But that takes yeah, time. That, that, and that, yeah, that slows the process definitely. Yeah, and I, also, I agree. The, like with regard to that, we also use uh, Gmail templates. It's uh, like a simple add-on that also makes things a bit easier. If you are not familiar with that, it's like a small, small thing that also can help. Mm -hmm. with, like sending nice personalized emails. Uh, okay, so so maybe um, I'll try two more and we'll yeah. be done. Okay. Uh, so what about uh, getting tongue-tied and not knowing what to say when you do you ever struggle with that? How to deal with it when you you know you're talking to people and uh, the conversation maybe dries out or you just have nothing to say? Yeah, it happens. <laughs> mm. uh, well, like uh, I don't really like well. It's hard to say, like within the con without the context, uh, but mm, yeah, again, like I would say that listening is, as I said, like is cool. So maybe it's good to have like one or two questions that are kind of relevant in a given social situation in the back of your head that you can kind of put forward. But it's also fine to walk off as well, like. Uh, if, if, if you're really pushing yourself to carry on that conversation, maybe you can just say, hey, I'm going for the mm -hmm. coffee or something. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. So having some safety net of a backup question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what you're suggesting. Uh, and and, and the, do, the, the, the fact that you, if you do homework, like as I say, like uh, research who is coming, why you want to talk to this given person, it helps a lot, uh, I would say. Uh, yeah, so, so for the last one, this one is quite uh, lengthy. 
Um, what is the best way to approach the stranger on LinkedIn who works in the food industry, animal agriculture? Is your communication based on some research? Uh, you mentioned that yes. Mm -hmm. And what that person talks about, what are his, her interests, and then you try to align your first reach, uh, reach out, or, uh, yeah, so, so do you, how, how much uh, personalization goes into it? Well, like, uh, the first thing to do would be to find the link between me and that given person, so the best way would be the personal link, so on LinkedIn you can see, like, what is the degree of connection? And I bet that in many cases, if you are even slightly in the network or food, food industry, it's quite likely that it will be like one person that is between you and that person that you want to reach. So I would firstly reach to that person that I know to maybe introduce me to a given individual over sending them a request because that always like, kind of fosters the, uh, the relationship and also um, kind of obliges that person to reply because it's, it's, it's reached out. It, it, uh, the, uh, like it's, it's not you who is reaching out, but it's uh, uh, people who know them. So, so that's, that's, uh, I would say that's the best strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So and I will always encourage like looking for those connections because we might seem that we are complete strangers, but if you try to uh, see who, the, who those people know, maybe there is already a link. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's easy to, to ignore someone uh, who isn't like from your social circle, yeah. but if it's someone close to you, especially yeah. then like you'd be disappointing them and and uh, so so yeah i guess having some proxy to contact this yeah, person yeah definitely a good idea okay great yeah. so we've had quite a long q a and thank uh, you and i wasn't expecting that like, i assume that everyone asked a question here <laughs> <Almost>. <laughs> yeah there were quite yeah. a few of them so thanks a lot and yeah uh, and if you feel like chatting on anything plant-based related non-plant based related food related let's talk Let's network, yeah. Let's talk, I, like because net networking, like it feels, it sounds weird, like it sounds unnatural. Let's talk, yeah. Yeah, great. See Thanks. You. Thank you.